Good evening. Uh, welcome, and uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Tim Muldoon. I'm the director of the Church in the 21st Century Center, and it's my pleasure to welcome Bishop uh, Gerald Kikanis to Boston, uh, who will be speaking on ministry in the 21st century. We're delighted he can join us. He was ordained a priest for the Archdiocese of Chicago in 1967, served in various capacities in uh, the Archdiocese of Chicago's seminary system. Uh, among other things, he uh, served as rector of Mundelein Seminary there. Um, he was also a lecturer in community and organizational development at Loyola University of Chicago. He was appointed Auxiliary Bishop of Chicago in 1995. Uh, he was Episcopal Vicar for the uh, Northwest uh, part of the Archdiocese, and I mention that simply because it just happens that he confirmed my brother uh, in that capacity. So we met actually a number of years ago, which my father reminded me of uh, very recently. Uh, he has done uh, postgraduate work in several areas, as well as a PhD in educational psychology and MED in guidance and counseling from Loyola University, and a licentiate in sacred theology from St. Mary of the Lakes Seminary in Mundelein, Illinois. Principal among his pastoral interests are vocations, the permanent diaconate, and encouragement of lay ecclesial ministry, and it was in that last category that he served an important role uh, on the bishop's committee, uh, serving as chair of the uh, committee that, that put out the document, Coworkers in the Vineyard of the Lord, just about a year ago. Uh, that was the topic of a recent C21 uh, conference. Uh, he has also been very active in uh, work on immigration, um, and, and that's certainly uh, one of his ongoing interests, uh, especially recently having been on a fact-finding mission to India and Nepal. So he has uh, many areas of expertise to bring to us this evening, and uh, we're very delighted to have him join us. So please uh, join me in welcoming him. Thank you very much, Tim, and it's uh, wonderful to be here at Boston College, as you know, a very highly respected university uh, here in the United States. And uh, so I bring greetings from uh, the U of A in uh, Tucson. We have no uh, Institute of uh, Catholic Higher Education in the whole state of Arizona. So if you want to move that you enjoy today, come on out to uh, Tucson. We'd love to have you. But I'm very grateful uh, to you, Tim, and to the C21 project and uh, Father Leahy, the uh, president of the university, for the invitation to uh, join you uh, for the whole day. It's been a very interesting day for me. I hope for those that I have met with, some of them are here uh, in this uh, room today. And uh, I think I have learned a little bit, and it's kind of enjoyable to be back on a campus. Uh, I spent a great deal of time in education, both on the high school and the graduate level, and uh, there's nothing more exciting than life on campus, so uh, it's good to be here. Uh, this afternoon, I'd like to uh, talk about a few things. First of all, a little bit about me, a little bit about you, a little bit about the times in which we are called to minister, to talk a little bit about what I think are critical for people who are involved in ministry today. One is to work in communion. Secondly, to work to build a just society. Third, to be able to hand on the faith, the treasure of what we believe to the new generation. And finally, that unless we maintain a spiritual center, Everything else is mere play acting. And then about 9.30 or so, we'll take a little break and uh, we'll be all set. A little bit about me. My name is uh, Bishop Jerry Kikanis. Uh, most people, when they first meet me, are concerned how to pronounce my name. And uh, our own family do not agree on how to pronounce our name. Some say Kikanis, some say Kikanis. My uncle actually changed his name to Kikonis. And my other uncle, who owned a business machine company, decided he better change the name of the, uh, so that people would be able to say it. And he changed his name to Kassain. So you can see that none of us agree on how to pronounce uh, our name. The only thing that's a little bit off uh, the uh, acceptable is kicking. Well, I won't finish that one. Uh, when people find out how to pronounce my name, and they want to know what nationality I am. And some people think Lithuanian because Lithuanian names end, of course, in AS. And when I was appointed to be the 
rector of our high school seminary, which was located very near Marquette Park in Chicago, which is the uh, heart of Little Lithuania in Chicago. Everybody was all excited that the new rector was finally Lithuanian until they saw me and they realized I wasn't Lithuanian. Some people think Greek because many Greek names end in AS, and actually the, the name is a Greek name, but both my mother and father are Lebanese. Now you can tell Lebanese by their noses. You see, most people have to have a little distance between themselves and the person they're talking to, but not my uncles. When they talk, they talk sort of like this, you see, because their noses are big enough that there's a natural uh, distance between the two. Uh, I've been out in uh, Tucson now five years, uh, originally from the Archdiocese of Chicago, uh, where I met uh, Father Harmon, uh, one of the Jesuits here on uh, uh, the campus. And, uh, of course, Tucson is a little different than Chicago. Uh, as you can imagine. Rattlesnakes, scorpions, Gila monsters. Uh, it's a little different. You know, we have uh, uh, cacti that tower uh, six to seven to eight to ten feet tall, the saguaro cacti with its arms reaching out. Uh, the Visnaga cactus, which is uh, called the barrel cactus. If you cut it open, you might find a little swig of water to get you through the desert heat or the Choya cactus, the jumping cactus, which if you get too close to it, it'll fix itself to you. And then you have to use a little tweezer to get those uh, thorns out of your arm or leg. Uh, so Tucson is a little different than Chicago. Uh, tombstone, the town too tough to die. It's still around. Or they're under a little challenge these days because some people question the authenticity of uh, Tombstone and the uh, gunfight that just took place in OK Corral. I think it's the, I forget what anniversary it is, but it was a significant anniversary. Uh, or Nogales, the town where there is a fence dividing Nogales, Sonora from Nogales, Arizona, or the great white dove of the desert, uh, the beautiful mission church established by Father Kino, a Jesuit who traveled through Pimaria Alta bringing the word of God uh, to the community uh, where he was. Tucson is very different than Chicago, but in a way not so different. You know, when I met over these five years our priests, our religious, our deacons, our laity, uh, there are people deeply committed to the church, highly invested in the mission of Christ. And so they're not very different than the community I met in Chicago. Uh, all committed and dedicated to the work of the church. And I, I don't know the Boston community or Boston College all that well, but I suspect that the same is true for you, that you are people deeply committed to the church and eager to help strengthen the mission of the church in this 21st century. And whether you're a student or a faculty member or someone visiting, uh, you have some commitment to what it means to be church, and I'm grateful for your presence. In terms of uh, a little bit about you, you know, we gather on All Saints Day, which is, of course, a very special celebration in the life of the church when we remember that we are part of a communion of saints bound together with all those who have gone before us, who from the very beginning of the church and its founding have tried to live as disciples of Jesus Christ. And here we are now in this third millennium. Uh, we just celebrated last night uh, uh, Halloween, and uh, I don't know uh, if you had a costume last night. Uh, one of my favorite costumes was a costume my grandmother made for me. I was to be a hot dog wrapped in a bun with uh, piccalilli and ketchup and mustard coming down. Uh, I didn't wear it today, I'm sorry, but uh, the uh, Feast of All Saints, of course, is a marvelous occasion in many of our schools, and, and this past Friday, one of our schools had a uh, little gathering where the kids dressed up as saints, and it was just delightful to see their ingenuity in all the ways that they uh, kind of prepared themselves to portray the saint that they had read about, and everything was so wonderful until I was going home, and uh, passed through the playground and there was St. Therese of the Little Flower beating up on St. Francis of Assisi. 
So I guess uh, it's more than clothes that creates the saint. But we are uh, gathered on the uh, Feast of All uh, Saints, uh, a time when we remember that we too are trying to live as faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, even as all those who have gone before us, men and women of heroic stature who faced incredible challenges in their lives and in their society. And here we are today in 2006, now responsible to carry on the mission of Christ. And I guess whenever Catholics gather uh, who are serious about their commitment to the church and to the work of the church, it's important to remember a couple of fundamentals, things that we ought never to forget in our journey whether we're teaching at a university or working in a parish or serving in Hispanic ministry, whatever is our responsibility. A couple of things that we have to remember fundamentally about ourselves. And I'd like to suggest that in any discussion of ministry or church, we have to remember first that we are called and chosen, that we are loved and blessed and built on that foundation, we can go about doing the work of the Lord. First of all, we are called. You know, and you can wander into almost any church in Rome and quite accidentally, serendipitously, come upon a magnificent masterpiece. When I was in Rome some time ago, we had a little bit of free time after meeting with some of the congregations. and. I was wandering around and I went into the French church there, perhaps you've been there, and I worked my way through the scaffolding. Every church in Rome is always under scaffolding as was the French church. And I wanted my way up to the front of the French church and there on the left were two true treasures, magnificent paintings by the great artist Caravaggio. Perhaps you've seen them. The one on the right is called St. Matthew and the Angel. And the one on the left is called the Calling of Matthew. And it was that latter painting that fascinated me. I stood there for the longest time watching it, trying to take it in. Now every so often I had to put a coin in the machine to keep it from going off. You know, those lights are only on for as long as your coin works. But I, I don't know if you've seen it, but in the painting by Caravaggio, there you see Matthew, the tax collector, of course, sitting at this worn wood table with some of his buddies, his friends. And on the table are all kinds of business paraphernalia, stacks of money. And in the corner of the painting is the image of Christ, almost totally hidden by Peter, who is standing in front of him. And in the painting, Jesus' hand is pointing directly at Matthew. Now in the painting, Matthew catches the glimpse of Christ pointing directly at him. And in the painting, you see Matthew with his hand pointing directly at himself, as if to say, who, me? But you see, that's exactly the point of Caravaggio's painting, that Matthew, the tax collector, undeserving as he was, is the one picked out, chosen, called by Christ to be the one through whom Christ's message would be proclaimed, taught, announced. And it's true for us, isn't it? None of us are deserving of the call that has been given to us, undeserved as we are. For whatever reason, Christ has pointed at us and invited us to be his disciples here and now, to be the ministers through which God's work would be accomplished. I'm sure you all remember being in school when sister or one of the teachers asked a question and everybody's head goes down and everybody wants to avoid being called upon. Or maybe when you remember being choosing up for teens in the Midwest, the custom was the two captains would have a bat and the one captain would throw the bat to the other captain and he would grab it and then they'd have to put their 
hands up and then you could put a few fingers one two or three fingers and the last one had claws chicken claws and the captain had a chance to kick the bat out of the hand and if he did then he got the first choice and if he didn't the other captain got the first choice and then everybody waited to see who was going to be picked first and I would wait and wait and wait and wait and finally be picked there's something about being picked being chosen and to really grasp what has happened to us in our lives as disciples of Christ and all the great saints that have gone before us is for whatever reason and who could explain who could possibly understand Christ has pointed directly at us and invited us to follow and so as we begin a reflection on ministry in this 21st century it's the phenomenal mystery of being called and chosen. Jean Guitant was a philosopher, a man of uh, great wisdom and intelligence. He was a friend of three popes, John the 23rd, Paul the 6th, and John Paul the 2nd. John the 23rd invited him to be a lay auditor at the Second Vatican Council and he was given the singular honor of being able to speak before all the council fathers on the reconciliation of Christians. A simple layman spoke boldly to the council fathers. Gitan always said that he was closest to Paul VI. He had a number of conversations with Paul on a wide range of issues. He said of Paul he was a gentle father who wanted to be heard who wanted to be understood. And so they engaged in many conversations, the culmination of which was the publication of a book by Guitton called The Pope Speaks in 1967. In that book, Guitton talks about many conversations he had with the Holy Father, often in French, because that was Guitton's primary language. And in the book, he reflects upon the fact that at some point in the conversation, kind of out of nowhere, Paul looked at him and said, I have an ecstasy and a tear for having been chosen. He taunt, paused and looked at the Holy Father and he said to him, Your Holiness, I, I can understand what an ecstasy, what a terror it must be to have been chosen the supreme pontiff of the holy Rome. no 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 paul said i have an ecstasy and a tear for having been chosen he taunt, paused again and, and said to the holy father i'm sorry your holiness i i completely misunderstood what you were trying to say i i, I understand now what an ecstasy what a terror it must be to have been chosen to be ordained a priest to be able to bring Christ present down no 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 Paul said I have an ecstasy and a tear for having been chosen a child of God washed in those waters baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You see, for Paul VI, the primary dignity that was his was that he had been chosen to be washed in those waters and to become a child of God. Everything else was secondary to that profound moment of change in his life. And so for us, as those called to be disciples of Christ in this third millennium. I hope we never lose track of the fact that we have been called, undeserved as we are. We have been chosen, washed in those waters. I don't know if anybody has been to the place where you ba were baptized. Perhaps you were. There may even be a little plaque there remembering that moment. But what a profound moment that was in our lives. When whoever it was that poured those waters over our forehead and said, I baptize you, John, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and you became a daughter of God, a son of God. It's that anchor that we have to begin any conversation 
about our ministry, that we have been called and chosen. Not only have we been called and chosen, but we have been loved and blessed. You, you know Henry now, and a prolific spiritual writer, probably you've read many of his books, you know how gifted he was, how articulate he was, how able he was to reflect on deep spiritual meanings in very simple and direct ways. One of the greatest struggles in Nouwen's life, of course, was whether he was loved by God. He doubted, despite all of his talent, that he was the beloved of God. He tells the story of being in a synagogue on a Saturday afternoon, and a young boy was being fully initiated into the congregation in his bar mitzvah celebration. And the place was fairly crowded. On the platform in front of the room stood the young boy who was receiving his bar mitzvah, the chief rabbi, and some of the other leaders of the synagogue. In the first row sat the boy's mother and father. And at some point, the chief rabbi said to his parents, please come up on the platform to be with your son. And hand in hand, the husband and wife went up the three or four stairs to the top of the platform. The father went right over to his boy, he let go the hand of his wife, and he put his hands around his boy's face and he looked him straight in the eye and he said to him, son, whatever becomes of you, whether you become rich or not, whether you become famous or not, whether you stay healthy or not, know that your mom and dad love you you're a great kid. We love you. And then he took his hands away from his boy's face. He took his wife's hand and they went down to the place where they were. And the ceremony continued and ended. And people left. And Nauen said he sat there in that congregation for two hours after that celebration. Because all he could think about was as if God had come over to him placed God's hands around his face, looked him straight in the eye and said to him, Henri, whatever becomes of you, whether you become rich or not, whether you become famous or not, whether you stay healthy or not, know that you're a great kid. I love you. It was in that moment that Nouwen says he experienced in a profound way that he was the beloved child of God. And how radically important was that moment in his life. And perhaps all of us have had that kind of a moment somewhere along the line that we realized that we were the beloved of God, precious in God's eyes. You know, Nouwen at the end of his life lived in a large community, a community for people with disabilities and those not, founded by Jean Vanier. And he tells the story once of being in this home, getting ready to carry on a prayer service for the house, when this little girl, Carol, a young girl with disability, came into the place where he was vesting and asked for a blessing. Well, he gave her a rather perfunctory sign of the cross on her forehead. And she looked at him and said, No, no, Henri, I want a real blessing. Well, there wasn't time. The service was about to begin. And so he went out to conduct the service. And at the end of the service, he said, Carol has asked for a special blessing. At which point, the little girl got up from her place, went right over to where we are standing, put her arms around his waist. He put his around her, almost enveloping her in the sleeves of the L that he was wearing. He looked down at her. He said, Carol, you are God's beloved daughter, precious in God's eyes. Your beautiful smile, your many kindnesses to the people in this house are an example of the beautiful girl you are. You are God's beloved daughter. And then he took his arms and opened them, and Carol went back to her place just beaming. And all of a sudden, Janet came up and came forward. And then Teresa, and then Fred, who worked in the place, stood up and said, hey, what about me? You see, everybody needs and craves blessings. 
And we have all been blessed by God, called and chosen, loved and blessed. It's on that foundation, as it were, on that bedrock, as it were, that we can build the mission of Christ. And as you work with students here at Boston College, it's critical that they come to appreciate and understand that they have, undeserved as they are, been called and chosen. And above all, they are loved and blessed. And because of that, they can take up now the task that has been entrusted to us. Well, here we are in the third millennium, the seventh great week, the age of Aquarius, the new age. Well, have you noticed it lately, Bob? Has the president been acting a little bit odd of late? Yes. I thought so. <laughs> and uh, has the bishop over in Providence been acting a little strangely of late? Probably, right? You know, they call it PMT, post-millennial tension. They say it happens for about 10 years after one in counters a new millennium. Now, I don't know, it's probably nonsense, you know, that there is such a thing as a post-millennial tension. But you know, it's very interesting, of course, we don't even know what age we're in, do we? Uh, Dionysius Exegus, Dennis the Small, in the 6th century, was first trying to cal calculate how much time had elapsed before the birth of Christ to his time. Now we know he was hopelessly wrong. So we're not even sure really what year it really is. But we do know that Rodolphus Glaber, an 11th century monk, did say in the 11th century at the coming of the millennium that the world, he said, as with one accord was shedding its cloak of antiquity. Imagine that, in the year 1000 they thought they were shedding their cloak of antiquity. No computers, no VCRs, no cars, but they were shedding their cloak of antiquity. You know, the time of the first millennium, things were calculated by Roman numerals, so they were entering into the age M. Big deal, that. But somehow, there was something going on. And we know that in a change of a millennium, there are movements afoot. We entered this third millennium having survived Y2K with a sense that we were going to enter a time of prosperity and peace unheard of in human history. And yet we know today that much evil still remains despite the fact that we thought we were entering a time of prosperity and peace unheard of in human history. We find ourselves still with war raging in so many parts of the world, poverty still the food of many, abortions abound, harm is inflicted on the littlest and weakest, threats escalate, we're afraid to fly in an airplane, to ride on a train, to sit in a cafe, to walk down a street. These are very complex times in which we are called to minister. You know, in the third millennium in which we find ourselves, the Pope gave us Pope John Paul II gave us quite an agenda, didn't he? He made quite a to-do about the third millennium. And he called the church to try to use this moment in history as somehow something that would spark us, encourage us, drive us to go out into the deep and to accomplish things that have never been accomplished. He set quite an agenda. He said, first of all, we have to work for the unity of all Christians, leading to full communion. He said we have to apply faithfully the teachings of Vatican II. We have to come to a new awareness, he said, of the salvific mission, 
given to the church by Christ. We have to sing a hymn of praise and thanksgiving to God for the great gift of the Incarnation. He says we have to promote the social teachings of the church, guarding human dignity and promoting peace. He challenged us that we have to purify ourselves, to seek reconciliation, and above all, he said, we have to stir in our hearts a longing for holiness. Quite an agenda for this third millennium. And as an institution of higher education in the Catholic tradition, it's important that we continue to try to move into this third millennium with some new vision, with some profound hope. You know, this has been terribly traumatic times in the church. Probably not the worst of times, but certainly a difficult, painful, awful time. And it's in that moment that we who have been called and chosen for this third millennium have the responsibility to carry on this agenda, this mission that has been entrusted to us. We know the complexities of the times in which we are called to live. We all remember September 11th and the tragedy of that moment in the history of this country. I don't know where you were, but I was in Washington for a bishop's meeting, and we had gathered early in the morning for our administrative board meeting. And soon after the prayer, someone came into the room and gave Bishop Fiorenza a card. And he announced that a plane had struck the World Trade Center. Terrible, we thought. We offered a prayer and then went on. And of course, then there was another note. And people realized there was something greater happening. And so the meeting broke up and people fled to every room in the place where you could find a television or a radio and find out what was happening, what was going on. We were stuck, of course, in Washington for days. And during that time, there were many prayer services and events because it had so shocked the nation. But the one that, remind, that struck me most was a candlelight prayer service held on the foots, on the steps rather, of the Capitol. And many people talked. There were songs, prayers. And one man from Oklahoma City got up and he addressed the people, talking about a birthday party that he had taken his little girl to some months before. He brought her to this huge house and let her go into the room, playroom, where the kids were having a great time. And he went into the living room to be with some of the adults. And the host had purchased these helium balloons, which the little ones were letting go, grabbing, letting go and grabbing. And uh, all of a sudden, there was a pop. And one of the helium balloons fell limp to the ground. And his daughter went over to the balloon. And she picked it up by the string that hung on to the burst balloon. And she came into the living room and she jumped into her daddy's lap and she held this limp balloon in front of him and said, Daddy, fix it. And all I could think about, he said, was as if on this day we jumped into God's lap and held up our world and said, Daddy, fix it. We live in a very difficult, treacherous, violent time. And how do we carry on the agenda entrusted to us in this third millennium of the church? Not only has it been a tumultuous time in the world, but a tumultuous time in the church as well. You have perhaps heard of Annabelle Miller, one of the editors of Tablet a uh, journal similar to America. She's no longer the editor, but at the time. And she wrote an article in which she said, you know, America is very concerned about the loss of people to the church. But let me tell you, she says, in Western Europe, we have experienced a massive hemorrhage. And she went around trying to understand what was happening, why this flight from the church. 
And she had came to three conclusions. She said, first of all, there was a young man who was raised as a Catholic, went to a Catholic grade school, Catholic high school, Catholic college. And while at Catholic college, one day, one Sunday, he didn't go to church. And he never, ever went back. She said, for that young man, faith had been kind of an overcoat that he wore when all of a sudden he shed it and he never put it back on. She says that some have never encountered Christ, have never met Christ, have never engaged Christ. And so their faith is simply like an overcoat that they wear at some point to be shed when it's no longer seems important. Second, she said, there are many in the church for whom the software of their lives don't mesh with the hardware of the church. There is a disconnect, and they simply can't relate the two, their own lives and what the church is teaching. And finally, she says, so many people have simply lost heart with institutions not just the church, but institutions in general. There is a lack of trust, there is a lack of confidence that there is any integrity in the workings of institutions. And so simply people have lost heart. Whatever the causes, we know the reality. We know, as Cardinal Koenig once said, that Western Europe, which used to be the heartland of Christianity, has become one of the most godless sectors on earth. And it's into this world that we find ourselves called and chosen to minister. I think a couple of things uh, are important. First of all, you know, our diocese covers 43,000 square miles. It's a fairly large geographic diocese. When I first arrived there, I was traveling from one end of the diocese to another to visit the various parishes and so on. And I was on my way to court sites. I don't know, anybody ever been to court sites? You know, it's the RV capital of the world, in case you don't know. But it's quite an interesting place, especially in the winter, where it increases by a uh, hundredfold. And I was uh, the uh, navigator, and John Shaheen, our properties manager, was driving. And we were driving along, and I was following the map. And the nice thing about Arizona is there's only one or two roads, so it's very difficult to get lost. But I noticed on the map that the next town was Hope. And I turned to John, and I said, John, have we gotten to Hope yet? At which point we both simultaneously looked out the front window, and there was a huge sign that said, You're now way beyond hope. And there's one of those signs in the front of this little town and at the back of the little town. Well, let me tell you, we are not a community without hope. Hope is the secret of the Christian life and the breath which is absolutely critical for the church's pastoral work. And so we cannot be a church without hope. And hope, you know, is different than optimism. Uh, Jim Good uh, was a, a person who was asking a group of individuals who were in a concentration camp, who were the ones that survived? And the answer was very easy. It wasn't the optimists. They thought they were going to get out of uh, the camp by Christmas or then by Easter or then by the new year, and their lives were terribly frustrated. Hope looks at reality. It faces reality. It sees reality, and yet is grounded in the realization that we live in hope, in the assurance that all will be well, that all will be well, that all manner of things will be well, as Julian of Norwich once said. So we are people who are not without hope. We're not beyond hope. 
But we are also in need of being woken from our tiredness and shaken from our lack of confidence, which I believe uh, limits the effectiveness of the church. We are tired. We've lost some sense of confidence. And so how do we minister as those called and chosen in this third millennium? Just a few simple suggestions. First of all, we have to work in communion. You know, as I travel around the 43,000 square miles of the Arizona highways, and I don't mean the magazine, but uh, the real highways, and I have a lot of time to kind of think, and sometimes I get some inspiration. And I remember driving into Yuma in the western part of our diocese. Now, some people could never imagine that anything grows in Arizona because there isn't much rain. But actually, in the Colorado River Valley of western Arizona, it's one of the most fertile areas, and it's actually the lettuce capital of the world because it is so productive. But one time driving into Yuma, I was looking out at the fields, and you see the lettuce pickers working. And you know, the work of lettuce gathering is quite a work of cooperation. Some grower has to plant the seed, and then somebody has to go and separate that seed so that it is some distance between each. And then has to be somebody has to pick the weeds to make sure that the crop can grow. And then the cutters come with their sharpened knives that they sharpen several times a day. And they hack that lettuce just almost at the ground level and place it in blankets so it doesn't get dirty. And then the packers come carrying these huge piles of crates, picking up three heads of lettuce at one time and putting them in the uh, cartons, weighing about 45 pounds when they're filled with 12 heads of lettuce. And whether you're the grower or the cutter or the trucker or the packer, everybody has a part in hauling in the harvest. And the harvest today is so challenging that none of us can do it alone. And we have to learn how to work in communion one with each other. You know, probably the greatest description of the church in the Vatican Council was the notion of communio, allowing for the simultaneous expression of sacramental equality and hierarchical order, that all of us have some role to play in the mission that has been entrusted to us, but we have to do it in communion, one with each other. One of the areas we've been talking about over the last day that I've been here is the document co-workers in the vineyard which try to affirm, acknowledge, recognize the role of lay ministers in the church, to see the emerging lay ministries as a cause for rejoicing in the church. But we know today that there are some who are concerned, suspicious, unsure. And in the development of the document, co-workers in the vineyard, there were many neurologic issues that surfaced among the bishops during those conversations. Uh, fears about what might happen. For example, the fear that by acknowledging, affirming, recognizing lay ministry, ordained ministry might be diminished. Or another fear that somehow by acknowledging the place of laity in the church, the primary role of the laity in the marketplace in the secular arena would be lost sight of. Or another fear that somehow by acknowledging lay leadership in the church, we might be establishing a special class of laity apart from the baptized, a kind of a clericalizing of the laity. And in the final discussions on the document, the concern about using the term minister or ministry of a lay person. And it was right that these concerns would surface because as one bishop on the committee said, it's critical that we get this right, that we understand what are the relationships of those who serve in the church and how we recognize the irreplaceable role of the ordained in the church, yet not to see the ordained 
as fully responsible for the mission of the church or that somehow the ordained are the church. So we need to understand what is the relationships that exists among us as priests, religious deacons, and laity. How to respect those differences and yet work in harmony and communion one with each other. You know, when I was at a gathering of uh, a worship service at uh, Tumacacri, which is one of Kino's missions that are established in Primaria Alta, it's no longer an active mission, but once a year there is a celebration there and all the native peoples come. And it's a marvelous, beautiful celebration. And in the midst of that celebration, at the end of it, there was uh, a group of the Pasquayaki people. And there were three people, uh, an elderly man, a kind of a middle-aged woman, and a young boy. And they all had ropes. And they started to do this dance with the music from the drums and the uh, rhythm instruments that the native peoples were using as they were singing as well. And they would sing, bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us. And all that time, these three individuals were intertwining these ropes, one with each other, kind of creating a sense of communio, of unity in diversity, from the young to the wise elder of the group. And so our need to work in communion, one with each other, and how difficult this is, because there are these petty jealousies, these some, some laity who can't stand priests and some priests who are suspicious of laity. And it's, it's difficult to form a sense of communion when sometimes we see ourselves in competition. Avery Dulles, as you know, uh, was part of this committee that was working on co-workers in the vineyard. And he wrote an article as part of, his, or part of his lecture series, the McGinley Lecture at Fordham. He said, ours is not a time for rivalry between clergy and laity or lay ecclesial ministers and apostles to the world as if what is given to one is taken from the other. Our times call for a cooperation, an involvement, one with each other, it's the only way we're going to be able to realize the mission of Christ in this third millennium. He says that just as the ear can't say to the nose, big as it may be, I have no need of you, so the lay ecclesial minister and the social reformer, the contemplative religious and the parish priest, have to say to one another, I need your witness and example to even better discern my own vocation in the life of the church. And so we need to work in communion. Secondly, we need to work to build a just world. You know, as Catholics, we can be so proud of what the church is doing in so many parts of the world. As Tim said, I was just in Nepal and India as part of a fact-finding mission for the Bishop's Conference to look at the situation of refugees uh, there, to look at the issue of human trafficking for sex and labor, uh, to look at the plight of unaccompanied minors. And neither Nepal or India are predominantly Christian and certainly not Catholic, but to see the witness and work of the church in those areas is very moving. Uh, the involvement of the Jesuits in Nepal for a long time have worked incredible work among the people. We visited the Bhutanese refugee camp in Damak, Nepal, and there a Jesuit priest, Father Varki Parakat, is conducting language schools, English schools rather, for uh, the 35,000 Bhutanese refugees that have lived in these camps from the time they were born. They have known no other existence. But to see the accomplishment and the work of the church trying to build a just society is very moving. I know since arriving in Arizona, you know, I didn't have much direct contact with immigration issues in Chicago, although there were many immigrants there. 
but since being in the epicenter of this, I become more aware and conscious of the need of the church to speak up on issues like immigration. And when I went down to Altar Sonora, which is a, kind of the gathering place where migrants make their trek north, and you meet the individuals, and you see and hear what they're experiencing. It's a very powerful and moving experience. Now, some people say the church has no place in that world. The, the church should stay in the sanctuary where it belongs. But listen to what Pope Benedict says in Deus Caritas Est. He says that the church in its deepest nature has a threefold responsibility to proclaim the word, to celebrate the sacraments, and to exercise the ministry of charity. He says, our time calls for a new readiness to respond to human needs. You know, with all the advances in communications, he says, the distances between us have been almost eliminated. So it's absolutely essential that the church be involved with all peoples and all needs. And finally, he says, in a powerful way, that the Christian's program, the program of the Good Samaritan, the program of Jesus, is a heart which sees. And so in this third millennium, we have to be people who have hearts that see, that see the pain and the struggle, who hear the cries and concerns of people around the world who are beckoning for a response from the community in which we live. Ministry is working to build a just society. We all know, and your Project C21 is very involved in the question of handing on the faith and how critical that is in this third millennium. We all know that there are so many people, even very educated people, who know very little about the faith, who understand what we believe very minimally. Dean Hoagie, along with uh, Bill D'Antonio uh, Davidson and uh, Mary Gautier, uh, are publishing a new book called Catholic Laity, Their Faith and Their Church. It certainly has a lot of encouraging statistics but others that give anyone in ministry or any school of ministry pause and concern. In that book, they review about 18 years of research on where Catholics are, and they divide the church into four groups. The pre-Vatican II Council, a uh, pre-Vatican II Catholics, rather, those born before 1940. Do we have any in this room? All right. Glad you're here. And then we have the Vatican II Catholics, uh, born between 1940 and about 1965. Where are we at? All right, there's the renegades right there. And then we have the post-Vatican II Catholic, the Catholic born between about 1965 and 1979. All right, a few of you trying to improve what's gone before, right? And then he has what they call the young generation, or the millennials, he calls them, both those born from 1979 or later. Anybody in here? Thank you. Well, we got two of you. Great. Uh, and you are, of course, the preoccupation of the church. How do we pass on to this young generation the treasure of the faith that we have come upon? And in that document, uh, that study, rather, uh, Hoagie and others say that the number of highly committed Catholics will diminish by about a third in the next decade. That Catholics will give less credence to church teaching and more to their own personal judgment. That Catholics, while they will still identify themselves as Catholic, will go to church far less often. That they will give credence to certain creedal statements like the divinity of Christ, the sacraments, Mary as the mother of God, but not 
give credence to other teachings of the church that are quite fundamental and central. In conclusion, they sense that there are more people aligned with the church than attached to the church. There are more people identified with the church than committed to the church. And for the young generation, they give credence to some of what the church teaches, but are not convinced by other teaching of the church. And so how do we bring the church, the treasure which we hold so dearly to this young generation, to the new millennials? I know that you are wrestling with that question here in C21, but it's a question that is certainly on the minds of every bishop. How do we bring this young generation to treasure and value the teachings that we hold as sacred and make the church come to life? How do we help them to see that they too are called and chosen, loved and blessed and entrusted with a mission to carry on the work of Christ? And finally, in terms of a spiritual center, you know, uh, Max Schleier was a brilliant German thinker. He was a professor of Jewish ancestry at Munich University. He was converted to Catholicism at 32 years of age. But from that time on, there began to grow a split in Schleier's person between what he was saying and what he was doing. The culmination of his work came in 1922 in a book he uh, wrote titled On the Eternal in Man. But from that time on that separation began to take place even more between what he was expounding on the meaning of sanctity and the personal giant, personal holiness giants of people like Teresa of Avila and Francis. His own life was becoming more and more disordered. The Archbishop of Cologne confronted him and his response was, look, I'm only a sign. I don't have to go in the direction in which the sign is pointing. His last work on the position of man in the cosmos was a terribly disordered piece that he ended with this phrase, I live in loneliness buried in ice. A kind of a chilling phrase spirituality and holiness can't be something we just espouse as people of faith. It can't be something that we just profess or teach, but it has to be something that is integrated and lived. And if as a church we lose our spiritual center, no matter what else we represent, it will be a clanging gong, uh, a symbol that has no meaning. And so we have to follow what the encouragement of our Holy Father is, that we stir in our hearts a longing for holiness, to try to get back to the roots of spirituality that are so rich in the tradition of the Catholic Church, whether we're talking about Ignatian spirituality or Franciscan spirituality or Carmelite or whatever. There are so many rich traditions of spirituality in the history of the Church that we ought to be teaching more and trying to live more. Three simple themes that I think are fundamental to every spiritual tradition that I would like to conclude with. The first is that we seek silence. A part of all of our traditions in spirituality is the importance of silence. Now, we're not monks. We're not contemplative. Uh, as much as we have present with us a monk and a contemplative. <laughs> and a precious and, and blessed life that is. But for most of us, that is not how we live. We live in a noisy world. And yet a part of all spiritual traditions is the importance of silence. George Niederauer, who is the Archbishop of San Francisco, often would describe life as a world of two benches. He says, and of course it's after Dickens' work, The uh, Tale of Two Cities, but he says life can be described as two benches. 
There is the bus bench and the park bench. Now we go to the bus bench out of necessity and we stay there only as long as we might, looking down the road, seeing if the bus is coming, checking our watch, pacing back and forth. But we go to the park bench just to sit. Nothing is accomplished. Nothing is achieved. We just sit. Now he says, whenever we inveterate bus benchers find ourselves on the park bench, our knees start to move and we get a little bit anxious because we want to be on with it. We want to be accomplishing and doing. But at the heart of all spiritual tradition is the need to seek silence. Kafka put it this way, you don't even have to leave your room. Just stay sitting at your desk and listen. No, you don't even have to listen. Just wait. No, you don't even have to wait. Just be still and solitary. And the world will open up to you. It has no choice. It will roll in ecstasy at your feet. Silence sitting on the park bench is fundamental to the Christian life. To be able to breathe in, to listen for, to hear the voice of God in our lives. Seek emptiness, also a critical part of all spiritual traditions. You all know Cardinal Bernadine, who is my Archbishop in Chicago for many years, and you know the struggles of his life. Perhaps the most painful moment in his life, of course, was being accused of sexual misconduct by a minor, his name on the headline of every newspaper. I was living, I was working rather at Mundelein at the time, and I remember getting a call very late at night from the Cardinal, and he said, Jerry, I'm very concerned about what the seminarians might be thinking, what might be going on in their mind. They must be terribly confused. Do you think I could come out and perhaps give a talk, answer their questions, what do you think? And I said, sure, Your Eminence, please come, we'd love to have you. The next week he came, we gathered in a room not unlike this with all 250 of the seminarians uh, and staff that were there. The Cardinal gave a little presentation, very brief, and then he said, are there any questions? Well, you could cut the silence with a knife, no one said a word. And finally, this one young seminarian very tentatively raised his hand and he said, Your Eminence, what was it like? And then there was this long, interminable pause. And finally, Car the Cardinal said, I was totally embarrassed. Here I am, the Cardinal Archbishop of Chicago, accused of sexual misconduct with a minor my name on the headline of every newspaper around the world, even in my hometown of Italy, for my family to see. I was totally embarrassed. I went home that night, he said, all by myself. I walked up the stairs to the second floor where my room was, and I walked into my room surrounded by all the honorary degrees and recognitions and gifts that I had been given by people from all around the world. And I prostrated myself on the ground, he said, as if I were naked. But do you know, he said, I experienced a closeness to God that I had never, ever experienced before in my life. You see, one of the great ironies of the spiritual life is that when we lose our life, we find it. And when we hold on to our life, well, we lose it. Seek emptiness. Seek an attitude of gratitude. You all know of G.K. Chesterton, the prolific writer and wise Western thinker. And you know, Chesterton was successful at everything he ever attempted. But the one sadness in his life was that he was never able to father a child. Their marriage was barren. This was a source of great pain for Chesterton. And so he would often go to 
nursing, I mean, to orphanages and homes for children, when, uh, especially around Christmas time. And the story is told that one time he went to this orphanage, which was his custom, around Christmas time. And all the little ones were gathered in this room, and he brought with him sacks full of presents, beautifully wrapped, and he threw them down in the center of the room, and all the little ones went diving into them, tearing them open and ripping them apart. And in the din of the excitement, Chesterton picked himself up from the chair where he had been sitting, watching. And he went off by himself, and the head of the orphanage noticed him out of the corner of the eye, and he followed him at a very respectful distance. And then Chesterton ducked into this darkened room, and he sat down at a chair along a table, and he began to cry. Well, the head of the orphanage waited for a period of time and finally broke in on him, and he said to him, Mr. Chesterton, I, I'm so sorry. You know, you, you have graced these children in so many ways, been so good to them constantly, and not one of them said thank you. Not one. I'm sorry, Mr. Chesterton. And Chesterton looked up at the man and he smiled and he said, Sir, sir, you, you totally misunderstand my tears. I'm not crying out of some sense of ingratitude on the part of these little ones, no. He said, when I was watching them, all I could think about was how good how gracious God has been to me. Sir, my tears are tears of gratitude for the ways God has graced and blessed my life. You know, as we move into this third millennium and try to bring to life the gospel message, the heart of it all has to be a spiritual center, a center where we seek silence, to encounter Christ, where we seek emptiness for the one who loses their life, they're the ones who find it, ironic as it is, and to seek an attitude of gratitude, the profound sense that all of life is a gift and a blessing. It's this rich spiritual tradition that we want to carry on and bring to this new generation. And I thank you for the work that you're doing in your various ministries, whether here at the university or in your own work world or in your own diocese or your own parish or your own studies, that we try to remember our need always to be grounded on the fact that we are called and chosen, loved and blessed. Let me end with a very short story about an elderly nun who was living in a retirement home now at the end of her ministry. And uh, she followed a very regular routine. She would rise early in the morning, shower, dress, cane in hand, walk off to the chapel where she would participate in Mass. And after Mass, cane in hand, walk down the long corridor very slowly, always stopping in front of the statue of the young Teresa of Lisieux, engaging in some conversation, and then went off to breakfast. Well, the matron of the home noticed this routine that Sister had, and she was kind of fascinated what it was that Sister might be saying to the young Therese of Lisieux. So sure enough, one day she planted herself behind one of the pillars in the hallway as Sister was coming back from the chapel, having showered and dressed and celebrating Mass. And Sister came to the statue of the young Therese as the matron listened in. Yeah, if you had to live this long, you wouldn't be a saint either. And she went off to breakfast. Now the issue is that we have to persevere in the task that has been entrusted to us. It's easy to begin a task. It's easy to begin a race. It's easy to begin a journey. But it's in the perseverance that the payoff really takes place. And so we have been called and chosen in this third millennium to preach the Word of God. And let's stay at the task. Thank you.